Hey guys, I pray you're blessed today. I wanted to talk to you about Psalms 91. And I am going to read it to you real quick. I actually have a couple of scriptures today. But I wanted to read Psalms. And I'm gonna, I, I have not been so well at reading it this week. But normally I try to read Psalms 91 out loud every day. And it doesn't matter if you read it out loud or not. But I try to read it every day. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I will trust. Surely He will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous, perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with His feathers, and under His wings you shall take refuge. He shall be your shield and your buckler. You shall not be afraid of the hair by night, nor by the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your right side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the most high your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you to take you in all your ways, to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra. The young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. Because he has set his, set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high, because he has known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him, and I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life I will satisfy him and show him my salvation." Now more than ever, we need to be quoting Psalms 91. God is our shelter. He is our refuge. And we, we have no need to fear anything. And I'm going to tell you two stories of when I was a child. Two different instances that happened in my life that God protected me. And I can see his hand of protection on me now more than ever. When I was eight... I had gotten this little stuffed dinosaur for Christmas, and I was told not to take it to school with me. Well, guess what I did? I took it to school with me, and I was on, it, it was fine the whole entire day. But I get back on the school bus to go home, and I have the dinosaur out, and I'm playing with it. Well, silly me, I stick it out the window, which is open, and I lose my grasp on it, and the wind blows it away. And as soon as the school bus stopped at my stop, I got off the bus and I ran, not home, but ran towards the direction where my dinosaur had blown away. And I'm going down this street that I have no clue where it leads to. And I'm looking frantically for this dinosaur because I knew I was told not to take it. And I can't find it anywhere. And I don't know how long I walked, but I, I soon realized I was lost. And so I'm just kind of standing there and I could just feel this internal battle within myself. And I'm, I'm just like, I don't know what to do. And I wasn't really talking to the Lord. I wasn't really talking to anyone. I was just kind of saying it to myself. I, I, I don't know what to do. I think I'm lost. And so I was trying not to panic and I was trying not to cry because I, I, I had always been taught, you know, you never take rides from strangers. You never do this. You never do that. Well, this lady pulls up in this green car and... She pulls up to me and she says, you're Brother Gary Golden's daughter, aren't you? And I looked at her kind of funny and she had this trustworthy face and I just felt safe with her. And I said, yes. I said, I am. She goes, are you, are you lost? She goes, you don't, you're not home, are you? I said, no. I said, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. She goes, you're lost, aren't you? And so finally I said, yes, I'm lost. And so she had me get in the car with her. And so she's taking me home and I'm, I feel safe, but I'm, I'm still like, did I make a mistake getting in the car with this lady? Because I have no clue who she is when I was taught not to get in cars with strangers. So she's taking me home, but she's talking to me the whole entire time, just trying to keep me calm. She pulls up to our, our house and she just says, Heather, don't, whatever, she goes, what, don't ever do that again, Heather, because it's not safe out there. And I said, okay. And I got out. I don't know who this lady was. I don't know if she was someone in our church. I don't know if she was a, a, a neighbor from around the, a, around the way. 
I don't know. For all I know, she could have been an angel. I don't know who she was. She could have been a good Samaritan. I don't know. I don't remember even telling her my name, but she knew my name. I don't know. It's been a long time ago. And so anyways, that incident happened, and that could have been very, very bad. I could have, I could have been kidnapped. I could have been, there's a whole lot that I don't want to even think about that could have happened to a young eight-year-old child alone. And nobody knew that I, what I had done. And so, there's a lot of instances in my life that I can see God's hand, but I'm just going to talk about these two. Then we have this neighbor, it was her and her husband who lived next door to us. And I always had this sense about her, this feeling about her that um, something was off about her, but I didn't know quite what it was. But I never felt comfortable around her. And mom and dad always warned me about her not to go into her house, not to take anything from her. But of course, I'm nine years old, you know. She was always offering me this beautiful jewelry. And I remember one time she gave me this necklace and she was like, it's, you know, it looks like Princess Jasmine's necklace and it would look so pretty on you. And of course I tried it on and I loved it. She was, you can keep it. What I didn't know was that this lady was a witch. She was a practicing witch. And so one day I'm out and I'm playing, we have a fenced in backyard, but I was playing in our driveway. I was riding my bike and stuff and just playing. And she starts calling my name and she says, come here, I want to show you something, but you have to come into my house. But I remembered my parents telling me not to come into her house. And I said, I can't, I'm not allowed to. And they, she's like, well, you know me, I've given you stuff. I'm not going to hurt you. And I said, but my mom and dad told me not to. And I really need to, I really need to try to do this. And I really need to try to listen to them because I didn't listen very well. <laughs> I'm just going to be up front. Long story short, she comes out all the way and tries to drag me into her house. And I'm yelling and I'm screaming. And my dad comes out and he's like, all big, um, you know, tough, you know, he's like, what are you doing with my daughter? And she's like, I'm not doing anything. And I said, daddy, she's trying to take me into her house. And so he said, let go of her or I'm calling the police right now. He goes, don't you ever touch my daughter ever again. He goes, don't you even talk to her? Don't you even look at her? Don't look at any of my kids to stay away from us. And so he, he came, um, he stood out there and I ran back into the house and so it wasn't that long after this incident that I remember my mom saying, oh my gosh. And we were looking out the, out the, the door, the screen door, and she had on this black dress that was kind of like flowy and then it, it had like strips hanging down from the bottom. And she had this long gray veil on that covered her face and almost reached about her hips. So anyway, she's, she's not got any shoes on and it's raining and she's dancing in our front yard. And I said, daddy, what is she doing? And dad said, don't worry about it. She's just crazy. Well, she's dancing and doing all of these different like seductive moves almost in our, in our front yard. And she starts twirling faster and faster. And then we realize she has something in her hand and she picks it. She launches her arm back and throws it with all of her might at the front door. And it comes crashing. So my dad, of course, went outside to see what it was. And it was the Bible. And my dad got righteously angry. And he rebuked her in the name of, the, in the name of Jesus and said, don't you ever throw the Bible at my house again. And she started sp spitting all of these curses out. And my dad just kept rebuking her and pleading the blood over us. And he made sure that we did not come outside. And so he just, he didn't even give her any time of the day after that. And he walked right back into the house and, um, he, and then he turned back around. And he goes, thanks for the Bible and shut the door. <laughs> and so it wasn't that long after that, that they moved away. I don't even know why they moved away, but they moved away. But I remember that so vividly how this lady who had so much hatred and anger in her and God only knows what she was going to do because she, she showed her true colors about how she felt about us and how she felt about God very very vividly and this is one reason why it's so important for us to plead the blood of Jesus not only over ourselves but over our families over our properties over our pets over our vehicles over just our lives in general 
because Satan is out to kill, steal, and destroy in whatever way he can. And he will use anyone, even your next door neighbor, to, to torment you, to, to try to curse you, to try to, to instill fear in you. But we know that no weapon formed against us shall prosper. You know, the enemy, he may formulate his plans, but they will never, ever prosper. And there are so many times that I look back in my life and I see God's hand of mercy upon me. I see his hand of protection moving. Even when I wasn't living right, he still protected me. He still covered me. Why? Because I had family. I had parents that were praying for me, who were praying for my salvation, who were praying that I would be drawn back to him. Because you see, I had never truly had a walk with the Lord. I had, I had been raised in church all my life. And I had never had a walk with the Lord, though, until I truly gave my life to the Lord in 2011. That was when I truly developed a relationship with Jesus. That's when I became a born-again, saved, justified, sanctified believer. And I was covered in the blood. You never know how... Your prayers for your loved ones who are not saved affect them. You know, I, I, I knew I wasn't living right, and I was convicted about the way I was living. I knew that, I knew that there was a God, even though my ex-husband was trying to tell me there was no God. And he would mock me when I, I would try to defend, my, defend that there was a God. And he had me questioning he had me doubting. He had me almost on the verge of being confused about what I believed. And it wasn't until I was broken when he left me and I found out he was having an affair on me is when I truly realized that I needed Jesus. And I, I didn't just need to know of him. I needed to know him on a personal level. Don't ever give up praying for those you love you know don't let the imminency of the rapture because we don't know the exact day or hour when Jesus Christ is coming we know he's coming soon we see the signs we see the season but for, for us to be able to say and pinpoint a day an exact day and an exact hour when he is coming we can't say but we see and we look and we have so many brothers and sisters in Christ out there who, who are looking at the signs, who are looking at all of these different dates, and they're saying, this could be a possible day. But don't let that stop you from believing that your family can be saved because God can do anything in a second. And I don't believe there's going to be any great awakening. You know, this is that gnar, gnar national Christianity, Christianity that has taken over America that says that there's going to be some great revival, some great awakening, and that there's going to be a massive um, revival and people are going to be saved in the, in the millions. But you know why they believe that? Because they believe that they have to usher in the kingdom of heaven, that they have to get everything in order, that they have to get these seven mountains conquered in order for Jesus to come back. Look what, we, look what, look what we've already made a mess of. How are we supposed to usher in the kingdom of heaven when we can't even keep peace right now? You know, but they, they truly believe that if they make not only America, but the world a Christendom, that it's going to usher in the kingdom of heaven. And that's not biblical. We know that the seven-year tribulation afterwards, the Bible tells us that it's a multitude of people that will come. That will come to Christ because we've been witnessing to them. We've been, we've been planting seeds and others have been watering it. And God's been, you know, he's been bringing the increase, but they're just not quite there yet. They haven't accepted Jesus Christ yet as their Lord and Savior. They haven't believed that he paid it all for them on the cross, past, present, and future sins. That they, are, they have not believed in the blood of Jesus and placed their faith in that blood, knowing that that has washed them white as snow. 
And God no longer sees our sins, but the blood of Jesus Christ. Just as that Passover lamb in Exodus, when when God told Moses to cover the the post of the door of the doors with the blood of the lamb, that was a representation of Jesus Christ and his covering of his blood. We are covered in the blood of Jesus Christ. And just as that death angel passed over those who had the blood on their doorpost, we are covered in the blood of Jesus Christ. And God no longer sees our sins. He sees that blood of Jesus Christ. But until that day when we're raptured, don't you ever give up on your loved ones because you never know the impact that you're having on them. You never know. And you better believe people are watching us to see and how we react to things and how we do things. I've, I've seen it all the time how people are like, I don't know how you do it. And I'm like, what do, you, what do you mean? I don't know how you don't lose your cool. And I'm like, well, it's not me. It's God. He, he, he helps me. Because really there's sometimes when I want to I wanna just blow my lid. But it, it's, it's God. You know, this past week has been a, a battle, not just, not just with the grief. It's, it's been work. Work has been exhausting. And I have literally come home every night just past the point of being exhausted. And I come down here and I look around and I see pictures of me and my husband everywhere. And I'm just like, you know, my, my husband, my companion's not here where I can, I can, you know, talk to him and help have him pray for me over what's happening at work like he used to do and comfort me and, you know, and so excited knowing that the rapture's happening and that we're going to be raptured together and that's no longer viable because he's already went on to be with the Lord. But no matter what circumstances are are here in your life, whether it's saved loved ones that need salvation, or you're going through physical elements, or mental mental attacks, or spiritual attacks, or financial issues, or relational relationship issues, whatever is going on in your life, know that God has it. He has you. And right now, Satan is using whatever is in his arsenal to try to wear you out. And there has been an uptick in the spiritual battle since October 7th, and it just progressively gets worse. And we see that these red heifers are significant. I mean, if that's not trampling on the blood of Jesus Christ, then I don't know what is. And they, they are still leaning on the law when Jesus came to fulfill that law he came in the stead of a red heifer a red heifer cannot purify your sins cannot cleanse you only Jesus Christ can only his blood can purify you and we see this all of these these lunar eclipses the blood moons the the April 8th eclipse the the eclipse that happened in August of 2017 and even the eclipse that happened October 14th of last year we see all of this stuff and we, we truly see and believe and feel in our spirits that this is something significant that God is showing us something and then people mock and laugh and scoff at us and tell us that we're crazy that we're we're reading too much into these signs that they don't mean anything but yet so many of us are feeling in our spirits that God is God is warning of his impending judgment on this nation, upon this world. It's like the last call, the last warning before the storm. And I can't, I can't stand here and say that April 8th is when we're going home. I pray it is, but we don't know. I'm, I'm at a lot with everyone who believes that I don't see how we can be here once those red heifers are sacrificed. But we don't even know. They could have already sacrificed one in, in secret and we don't know. God's got his perfect timing. 
And while we're waiting, we need to be about our Father's business. We need to be praying for those who are lost. We need to be interceding for them. We need to be witnessing to them and planting seeds. We need to be encouraging the body who is tired and, and exhausted and past the point of thinking that it can go on. We have to be there for each other. Carry those who, who need a rest. Pray for them. Intercede on their behalf. Pray for a renewing in their spirit that they won't grow weary. Pray Psalm 91 over you and your household. Something wicked this way comes. And I, I can't point my finger at it and say it's this. I've... I've I've got my wonderings, but I can't say, thus saith the Lord. And this, and I don't believe in instilling fear in people. This is not what this channel is about. I am not about fear. Because God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind. And anybody who's speaking fear into you and trying to make you afraid of the things that come, just, just take it out. Just ignore it. And like I'm always telling you all, if I say something, take it to the Lord and pray about it. Take it to the Lord and pray about it, guys. Don't, don't just take my word for it. If it doesn't line up with God's word, then just take it with a grain of salt. Please don't ever just take anything that I say and say, oh, this is, this is thus saith the Lord. No, nothing I ever hear, say here is thus saith the Lord. I can say this is what I feel in my spirit the Lord has given me, but to say thus saith the Lord, I can't, I'm not a prophet. I never have claimed to be a prophet, never claimed to be a teacher, a preacher, anything of the sort. And there's sometimes when, when I mess up of scripture, there's sometimes when I get things a little backwards because, well, I don't have my Bible always out in front of me. And it's like, I think I know a scripture and then I, I kind of get it a little twisted and I don't mean to. You know, we have to give each other grace and mercy where there needs to be grace and mercy. But also, if you hear me misquote a scripture, please bring it to my attention because I don't ever want to misquote scripture, especially unintentionally, which that would always be the case. I would pray. Um, but I wanted to bring this, I wanted to read this last scripture to you and just let it bring peace and comfort like it did yesterday to me. I I was in a lot of turmoil, you know. I tried to make this video several times and all I could do was cry. And I knew in my spirit, no, you don't need to be making a video when you're this distraught. Because it's not going to come out in the way God wants it to come out. So I'm going to read to you Isaiah 40, starting at 28. Have you not known, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary, his understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak, and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with the wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Isaiah 40, 28 through 31. We have to keep our focus on Jesus. If you're getting tired and weary because of the news, the bad news that just keeps pouring out, just take a break. If all this end times prophecy is exhausting you and wearing you out, take a break. God's not going to be mad at you because you haven't lost your faith and your hope in the rapture. But sometimes you just got to take a, a mental break because it can be overwhelming with everything that is coming out it brings me joy and comfort knowing that soon and very soon we're going to be with jesus and i'm going to be with my anthony again and that i'm going to get to meet all of you in person face to face and we can hug each other and say we made it we made it through by the grace of god we made it through but i know sometimes i even get boggled down and just exhausted by the, by the constant attacks. And I've come to the conclusion. And I, I, I acknowledge this now. I couldn't see it before. But I acknowledge it now. That people's comments were upsetting me. 
And I had to take a step back and I had to realize that not everybody is going to agree with the way that I, the way that I believe. Not everybody is going to agree on everything, but if it's not a salvation issue, then why be worried about it? You know, if it's the rapture or, or whatever, secondary, and you know, doctrine, just let it go and let God be the judge of that. Like I'm always saying, if you don't agree with something that I say, pray about it. Ask God to reveal the truth, not only to me, but to you. If Because none of us are perfect and none of us know in truth. 100%. When we won't know until we're in heaven and we completely understand God's word. But we have got to stop attacking each other and belittling each other and taking each other down. You know, this, this warning is exhausting as it is. Telling people that Jesus is coming and they need to seek Jesus now while the period, the age of grace is still upon us. Because soon the tribulation is going to start. And when the tribulation is going to start, it will be no more grace. You will have to, you will have to give your life for what you believe. And there will be no other way. There will be no other way. There will be no no other way to go through the tribulation but believing and trusting that God has you no matter if you lose your life or not. The Bible tells us in Revelation that there will be a mass multitude of saints that have been martyred for their belief in Jesus Christ. There's going to be the 144 male virgins. I, I want to say it that way because there are people who believe that even though they're not Jewish and even though they are female, that they are going to be one of the 144,000 that are sealed and that they are going to some secret bunker and they're getting trained on how to be one of the 144,000. And sadly, a lot of people are giving into it. Don't, let's not even go down that rabbit hole. But anyways, um, you know, there'll be the 144 male virgin Jews that are sealed who will be going out and witnessing. There are the two witnesses that will come. And I think it's the first three and a half years of during the tribulation. They will come and they will be witnessing and they will be hated, vastly, grossly hated for their witness of Jesus Christ. And they will be martyred and left in the street for dead for three, three and a half days. And it will be broadcasted everywhere. People will be celebrating these two witnesses' death. They will be celebrating and rejoicing that these two witnesses are death. And there's some people who believe it's, um, who believe it's Moses and Enoch. I tend to believe that it's Enoch and Elijah because neither two, neither of them tasted of death. But some believe that based on the miracles that are going to be performed, that it's going to be um, Elijah and Moses. But I don't know. I think I said Enoch the first time, but it's Elijah and Moses and then Enoch. I believe it's Enoch and Elijah because neither one of those tasted of death. They were both caught away. They were caught up. Elijah in the whirlwind, and then Enoch was just taken. But regardless, like I said, that's a secondary, you know, none of us know for sure who that is. We all have our speculations, but none of us know. Maybe we'll be up there in heaven watching what's going on, eating heavenly popcorn. I'm just joking. I'm just joking, guys. I'm making, I'm making a lot of a serious situation here. Um, it's just how I, how I, how I do things. I have a sense of humor. It's probably why my husband and I got along so well because we both kind of had a twisted sense of humor. But anyways, um, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm rambling. There, all of the seven years of the Great Tribulation are, are going to be horrible. It's Jacob's time of trouble. Not the church's time of trouble. Jacob's time of trouble. And who is Jacob? Israel. God changed Jacob's name to Israel. So it's going to be Jacob's time of trouble. This, the first three and a half years is not going to be 
event-free. There's going to be things going on. There's going to be the seven seals, the seven trumpets, the seven bowls of wrath that are all going to be pouring out. Not at the same time, but it's going to be like each one is going to progressively get worse than the others. And the others are going to happen and play in like, we, it isn't, we're not told the timeline of exactly when all these are going to happen. But I don't believe that the first three and a half years is just going to be perfect with nothing going on. I believe there's going to be, there's going to be a lot going on. Just with the rapture alone, there's going to be, there's going to be casualties because cars are going to be crashing. There's going to be airplanes falling out of the sky because the pilots have excuse me, have been raptured. There's going to be trains derailing. There's going to be cars that are, that are driverless. There's going to be, there's going to be a lot going on at that instant. There's going to be pandemonium and, and, and fear when people realize that their children are missing, that their spouses are missing, that their parents are missing, that there are people that they love and know that are missing. And then once the panic calms down a little bit, people are going to start putting two and two together. Oh my gosh. They believed in the rapture. They told me that this would happen. This would, this had to be the rapture. And they told me not to believe anything that the government said to try to cover up why all of these people left. You know, I think in my, my left behind note, I'll have to read it to y'all one day. In my left behind note, I told people it wasn't, it wasn't an alien invasion. We weren't abducted by aliens and that it wasn't some great catastrophic climate change event. It was the rapture. But guys, these are exciting times we are living in. But if it's tiring you, if it's exhausting you, take a break. God's not going to be angry with you for having to just stop focusing on what's happening. And just focus on Him. Realign with Him. Make sure you're keeping your eyes on Him and not on what's going on. I've slowed down on what I'm watching. And I love Brother Chris. And I love Lisa Boyce. I love all of these... I love Brother Tom. I love all these brothers and sisters that are bringing the news. But every once in a while, I just take a mental break where I don't watch any of that. Because I just have to focus on God. And get my mind focused off of what's happening in this world. And just focus on Him. And just, just bask in His presence and bask in Him. Because He is good and He is worthy and He is worthy of our praise. If you don't know Jesus Christ, now is the time. Now is the time to believe in him. To place your faith in him. 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4 tells us that if we believe, just as these scriptures say, that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins, that he was buried on the third day he rose again. That's the gospel. You will be saved. And then Romans 10, we're told, I think it's 10, 10 and 9, we are told that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. There are scripture after scripture that after scripture that tells you to believe. It doesn't say turn away from your sins. It doesn't say stop sinning and then come to Christ. It says if you believe. You see, that's the beauty of it. When we come to Christ and we believe in what he did on the cross for us, that his blood paid the atonement for all of our sins that we would ever commit past, present, and future. And when we rely on him and him alone, he cleans us up. He washes us clean. He, we are justified in the eyes of God and made righteous we are righteous through Jesus Christ. Not our own righteousness, but Jesus Christ's righteousness. We go through a, a cleansing called sanctification where things are being pulled out of us. Old habits that we used to have. Old sins that we were holding on to that we don't need. He starts pulling us and cleaning us up. But you have to allow him to do this process. You can hinder it. You can hinder the Holy Spirit moving in your life in that way. But let me tell you, there's nothing more than letting go of all that baggage that you don't need. Now, I'm not sitting here saying that I'm perfect and that I don't sin. I, I, have, I deal with anger issues. I lose my temper sometimes. I say things that I shouldn't say. I act in ways I shouldn't say or act in ways I shouldn't act. I'm not perfect. And I don't claim to be perfect. But I know that I am made righteous through Jesus Christ and his blood that was poured out for me. 
And that same blood that was poured out for me was poured out for you. You are dearly beloved. You are loved more than you could ever know or comprehend. Come to Jesus. You know, he loves you. And you're, you're going to fall. You're going to slip on this journey. But that's when you get up. You get up. If you need prayer, you know, the Bible tells us to confess our sins to each other because that's when we start praying for each other and encouraging each other. When we do fall, when we do slip, that we can pray for each other and lift each other up. You don't beat up a brother and sister in Christ when they slip up. You pray for them and you encourage them to get up and keep going. We need that encouragement. But if there's so many times that I have seen people, oh, well, he had an affair on his wife. It was just a one-time thing, but he still had an affair on his wife. And just push them away and say, no, you're, you're no longer part of the, of the bride. You go away. Shoot, shoot, we don't want you. We don't want you here. That's not our job. You pray for them. You lift them up. You encourage him. You encourage the wife and you pray for their marriage. You pray for them. You ask God to bring restoration when there needs to be restoration. You know, the Holy Spirit convicts us. And you better believe if you're doing something that's wrong, you're going to be convicted. You're going to be miserable. You're not going to be allowed to wallow in your sin. You're going to feel dirty about it. You're going to feel, Lord, I'm sorry I shouldn't do that again. I, I know that was wrong. Help me not to do that again. I need you to help me because I can't do this without you. And you can't. If you were trying to stop sitting on your own, you are going to make yourself miserable because that... That is a work of the flesh. You are going to wear yourself out trying not to sin within your own self. Quit doing that and allow God to help you. Only God, only Jesus Christ can help you not to sin anymore. Only by the Holy Spirit indwelling inside of you can you overcome the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, can't remember all off the top of my head. I'm sorry. I just read that scripture not too long ago. Um, only then can you can you overcome these things. But we are made overcomers through Christ. Not I'm not an overcomer through Heather. I'm an overcomer through Christ. You know, and we have to die to this flesh daily, and it's not always fun. It's not fun. Let's put it that way, because this flesh wants to do what it wants to do. But that's when we have to pick up our cross and carry it, Lord. I've got this desire that I'm really wanting to feel, fulfill, and I need you to help me. I need you to help me to make it through this because I'm not going to be able to resist this without you. And you better believe he'll help you. Somebody will come along and just start talking to you and praying for you. There'll be encouragement. There'll be, you'll see a video on YouTube that's exactly about what you're going through. God has his, will, his ways of helping us. But anyways, I'm going to go ahead and get off here because this has went a lot longer than what I, what I had thought it would go. But I love you guys. If you have any prayer requests, please put them in the comment section. If you want to privately email me, it's in the description box. My email is, please feel free to email me. And I love you guys, and I will talk to you very soon. And keep looking up, guys. Don't get discouraged. We are going home. We are going home, and it's going to be soon. So just hold on to that hope and let no man steal your crown. I love you all. God bless. Bye.